So this is the topic of the conversation this afternoon. Uh, simply speaking, the design industry must become representative of the world it serves. Uh, so I'm here to talk about representation, but I do want to add in a couple of notes before I start. I am very passionate about this subject. I think it's vital that we're all talking about it, but I am not an expert in representation or discrimination or bias or the barriers it gives to design from my own lived experience. I just care about equality and doing my degree in sustainability and growing up in a single parent family with one parent who was from Finland, mentioned in Ria's talk as well. They're fairly obsessed with equality up there. And so now I've been working in the design sector for about eight years. Um, it's become glaringly apparent that there is a major problem within it. And I think we've all got a part to play in how we fix that. So a month ago, we started a project called Design Can, which Lewis mentioned in his um, blurb about this talk. And it brings the conversation of representation directly into the design sector, talking about how it's relevant to our um, industry. I know there are some people here that don't necessarily work in design, you're just passionate about Della Spada and what they do. Um, but we yeah, care so intimately about what we do for a living. I run a PR company and we have a consultancy and we make film. And from meeting lots of journalists, meeting lots of designers, representing lots of um, designers that come from minority groups, um, th over the years it's become apparent that actually enough conversation and there was time that we did something about it. So I want to start talking about how bad the problem is and so we're going to go through some statistics first. Um, brace yourselves, <laughs> it's a pretty dire picture. Um, starting today with just the UK population um, from the 2011 census, uh, it states that almost 52% of the population identify as women and girls. 16.5% of our population have disabilities, which is 11 million people in the UK, which I think is shocking. It's a statistic that I was very uh, detached from. And 12.8 come from a black, Asian, minority, ethnic backgrounds. So that's 8.1 million people. If we think of that as our country, who we are, the people that rely on designers, and architects and engineers and people that care about and create our lived environment. The fact that design is 78% male across all sectors is really shocking to me. I don't know if that, familiar, if that statistic is familiar to you, but that is design in its entirety. And that encompasses industrial and product design, engineering, graphic design, architecture, and digital. So the percentage of people working in design is and that a male is 25% higher than the percentage of men in the wider UK workforce. And remember that only 49% of our population is male, which is a nearly 30% third disparity. Um, breaking it down further, if we think about um, the fact that 78% does sound terrible, but I think it doesn't quite make it quite so urgent sounding because the classification of design is so broad that people go, hey, 80%, and mm, that kind of makes sense. Male, female, you know, later on in life, boys care more about design than girls. That type of kind of made up, um, almost desire for <laughs> what the problem is. When you actually go through these statistics that product and industrial design, which of course is everything that we engage with um, in terms of furniture and cutlery and transport and just so many of the things that we use in our lives, 95% uh, male. So out of 100 people working in those sectors of design, five of them identify as female. Um, fashion and music are also involved in the statistics for design, so they kind of pull up the percentages a little bit. But um, no offence intended, but these men, <laughs> honestly, no offence, guys, are designing how we live. Like They're designing what we use, how we work, our services, our transport, our homes, our technology, they are um, designing how we function. And I find that deeply intimidating. Digital design, 85%. Uh, and then architecture, again, I don't know if you know this statistic, it's been publicised quite a lot of late, but 80% male. I'm going to come back to this topic in a few moments. But there was a book that came out um, a few months ago called Invisible Women and it was bursting with statistics about how the world has been designed for men, uh, by men. 
and it highlights, there's a beautiful quote from the Sunday Times, which said that it's highlighting the institutionalised complacency, which I thought was a genius statement for what's going on, because it's, it's apparent, and there is such complacency because people aren't really fighting for a change. It's kind of just the way it is, and it's working out for so many people within our sector that actually change isn't coming particularly quickly because you know, people are worried about what they might lose if they do kind of make way for something new. But what's really shocking <laughs> is that two thirds of students who study design identify as female. So of all the students at uni, which is after the sector of kind of design education that Rio was talking about earlier, sorry to all of you that didn't see her talk, but it was completely about design education and rethinking it. There are lots of people that identify as female who are really excited about design, want to work in design, want to become engineers and architects and product and industrial designers. And though two thirds of those students are female at university, um, they're just not cutting through. For some reason, upon um, graduation, and we don't know what the reasons are yet, um, yeah, women are falling away and men are getting the serious jobs and the management level jobs. Um, architecture is also 93.7% white. Uh, the stats are gonna end in a sec, by the way. I just need to like get this off my chest and out into the air. Um, <laughs> but that statistic combined with 80% male means that there's just 6.3% um, of people in architecture. And that isn't just the architects, that is the architecture sector. So if you think about how many people are involved in creating what we call architecture, 6.3% of those people do not identify as white. Um, compared to our UK average of 12.8. So it's half and coupled with 80% male. Um, I just find it so disturbing. And as I mentioned before, these people are designing our civic spaces. They're designing our homes, our places of work, our places of leisure, our places of joy, of rest, um, our furniture. And then, you know, ultimately they're designing our safety. These people are responsible for so many aspects that keep us safe. Um, so, that's kind of where we start. And that's where our team, from doing lots of research and representing our clients in the design sector and talking to journalists endlessly, when we read the, all of these statistics are from the Design Council's um, Design Economy report from last year. And it was upon digesting this information that actually we suddenly all felt the fear that not only is it completely wrong, but our industry <coughs> is teetering on the edge of something. Like if it is so, if it's not representing our human beings in our society, then what is it? And how long is it going to be relevant for? And who is suffering as a result? Because someone is always suffering in this scenario. Um, finally, kind of when we go through those statistics, there currently are no statistics at all for people with disabilities in the UK. And when you think that the earlier statistic of saying that um, 11 million people in the UK have a disability, to not know how that statistic correlates with the design sector is a major gap in the research. And although the Design Council do loads of great work, that is something that we need on the agenda for the next report, which I think will come out in three years' time. Um, because, yeah, so many people would benefit from that data. If we don't know how many people with disabilities are invested and employed in the design sector, then it's impossible to kind of go anywhere from here. We're so statistic-led, we need to know the problem, the scale of the problem, and where we're going in order to do something about anything, or get the funding to do something about it. So how do these um, figures affect people's lives? How do you think it affects your life? If you think of yourself right now, like, do you suffer from a disability? Lots of disabilities are invisible. Do you identify as a minority? Do you identify as male, female, or non-binary? You know, can you apply this like thinking and this set of data to your own existence? And actually that's a test that's done by a guy in America whose name I've forgotten, which is terrible, but I will find out. And he, Steve Stance or something, I think it's called <laughs> Steve Stance. He does lots of work in bias. So David's Canadian, so he likes my American accent. Um, but he does an activity with, in lots of business environments where he asks everyone in the group to for one minute and one minute only, think about how their race has impacted their lives. And everyone who identifies as non-white 
start scribbling immediately. They can think of examples from their school life, from walking down the street, to getting employed, the recruitment procedure, all these different ways in which their lives have been affected by their race. And in almost all circumstances, any participants in that activity who are white find the activity thoroughly frustrating and actually have nothing to write down. Because, I mean, he does this in North America. We don't, in the way that our society is set up, if you don't identify as a minority of some kind, actually there are very few barriers to anything except your interest level or your, you know, your level of education. Of course, financial um, incentives come in strongly, but I think that was a really interesting um, activity that, again, I'd never thought of because also I don't really think about how race has affected my life or didn't until we set up this um, project over a year ago. So I identify personally as female. I'm 37. It was my birthday a couple of weeks ago. I am... Uh, I don't identify as disabled, but when I was 29, eight years ago, I did uh, lose the majority of my hearing. I wear little hearing aids now that save my life every day. Um, so actually, until the age of 29, I didn't have any of the factors that are kind of standing against many people who are trying to survive in general, but are trying to get into the design industry. Didn't affect my schooling, my uni, my early career. So I was untroubled in general. Um, there's no understanding as to why I can't hear, but you know, now there are, there's design that's been created to help me kind of feel very much the same as I did before. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm getting a bit personal actually, but I'm trying to think, I'm always trying to put myself into the position. I will never understand what it feels like to come from a minority group. And obviously there's lots of conversations about gender, but we make up more than half the population. We are not a minority group. We are just sidelined from a lot of conversations, which kind of enables us to feel like we're part, part of a minority group. But actually, there, it is something very different. So this quote by a man called Joseph Henry, who's a senior project officer at the GLA, he said, I'll give you a moment to read it and to drink some water. But Joseph Henry did his part one in architecture in Brighton. He did his part two and his MA at the CAS in London. Uh, he's worked at numerous architecture practices. He's a visiting lecturer of the VNA and now he works at the GLA. And his quote says, I've never been taught by or taught with another black person. I've never worked with a black person in six years of practice or ever had a black client. And that is just unthinkable. Again, if you try and put yourself into that perspective, it's completely unthinkable that that would ever be possible in education, in work, as obviously a white person in a majority white country. But, you know, our country is 12.8% BAME, so you think that within that context of education and architecture, and then working with people who are just buying their services, he's never, ever um, worked with another black person, just seems, just again, just so shocking. And last year there was an, uh, an article in the Architects Journal saying, kind of with the title, how can we make architecture more diverse? And they interviewed lots of, lots of people about this problem. And unfortunately, everyone kind of underlined the fact that it is going to be extremely slow, painfully slow, um, for lots of reasons, specifically in architecture, in the fact that it takes seven to 10 years to train. It's wildly expensive. Um, and it's a profession notorious by a culture of nepotism and in their words, casual racism and a serious underrepresentation uh, under of ethnic minorities. So in addition to kind of that world of thinking where there just is no exposure to either peers or role models um, for someone like Joseph, who came to the launch of Design Can last month and um, talked about this issue, you know, our conversation led on to the fact that at the moment it feels like architecture is only for those who can afford it. You have to be able to afford your training, you have to be able to afford 10 years of training where you don't earn, you know, a full salary. You do obviously do lots of um, in-practice work as part of your architectural training, but you're still, you know, very much a student. Um, so architecture is kind of siphoned off for people that get to go to special schools, potentially in part funded by the bank of mum and dad, who take on a frightening amount of long-term debt. Um, and so few people kind of have the courage and financial ability, 
courage is a funny word there, but you know, you've got to be quite brave to take on masses of debt by doing any degree nowadays. Architecture is just another level. So with that in mind, the people that do actually graduate are people who have probably grown up in fairly comfortable circumstances who are designing for those who haven't. And that gap is again something that if you're designing housing for you know people who come from low-income families or in cities that have lots of struggle that's scary and that's serious and as someone who is middle class and white i don't have to think about these things but of course if you believe in equality and you work in a society and you care about your community um, and you want basic progress it does start feeling very personal the world so again, I'm jumping a little bit because there are lots of issues to talk about all at once within this banner of representation. The World Health Organization estimates that there are one billion people in the world currently living with a disability. So that's one in seven people have some kind of disability. And four fifths or 80% of those people are unemployed. For some reason, we have this idea that disabled people um, are unemployable. They have no use to um, Kind of our financial system, our capitalistic model, and that also just seems like it's totally nonsensical. It's nonsensical to have a group of privileged people designing our cities and our schools and our social housing, and it seems like a nonsense that we have all these human beings who may have a physical or mental disability, but they're still human beings with lots to offer. Like, you know, these statistics are helpful for just pointing out areas of just complete lunacy. Um, and we had an amazing meeting last week with a guy called James Lee, who got in touch with us again because we launched Design Can, which I'll tell you more about later. He works at the mayor's office and he got in touch and we were extremely thrilled to meet him. Turns out he's a total legend as well as being a really interesting human being. And from researching him before he arrived, we found out that he is in a wheelchair and he wrote a really amazing feature in the FT talking about um, the uphill struggle um, of hiring the disabled. Um, and that good intentions, in general, the whole argument or the whole article was stating the fact that there is so much good intention. People know that it's right to employ people who have disabilities and the government have actually made it much harder to um, uh, leave people with disabilities to one side. But actually, the physical and the, the realities of working with people with these extreme conditions in some cases is, isn't is really difficult you know physically even James coming to our office it was the first time that we realized that can James even get into our building the keypad that you have to use to get into our building is really high up so sitting in a wheelchair we weren't even sure if he'd be able to reach it and then when you do get buzzed in by someone if you can hear them as a hearing aid wearer buzzers are a nightmare I have to literally squash my hearing aid next to the speaker to hear what anyone says so if you're in a wheelchair and you're deaf or you're hard of hearing that's out and then when you do get buzzed and you have to lift this incredibly heavy gate and then maneuver a wheelchair and we've been there for nearly three years and it's the first time ever that we've had to think about how to help someone with disabilities get into our block these like constant realizations are just such a they yeah they again just become quite overwhelming and just the the injustice of it because it's a five million pound development and these things should have been thought of and actually, of course, now that we know they exist, we're going to give the building loads of hassle until they get it sorted because it's right and it's basic. Um, and also there's no cover if it happened to be raining. So you're stuck outside in a wheelchair, not being able to reach the buzzer and you're sitting in the rain. And just the whole situation was just absolutely horrifying. And that is the reality now of kind of employing people with disabilities, but realizing that your um, social setup and your physical setup in your work environments are not set up for people from those different backgrounds. So we've got a way to go. Um, and in his article, actually, it was highlighted one of the gravest problems of people with disabilities is those with invisible ones. So blindness, deafness, um, mental illness, and learning disabilities. And recruiting for jobs online is something that is also, for many people, completely impossible. So even if you make the jobs available, the barrier of trying to sign up or if you're partially sighted or you have you know dyslexia or autism you know those 
again, there's just 15 more barriers to actually being able to apply for the job that you're trying to be really open-minded and, you know, employ anyone to come and work for you, but there's just too many obstacles. And of course, no stats in our case. Um, we worked with an amazing charity called Intoart last year and the year before, and they work with people with learning disabilities um, in South London. They've got a studio in Peckham, which has a workshop um, where people with learning disabilities come and um, well, they're all artists and creatives, so they go into the workshop because that's where the facilities are. And it's completely set up for people that have specific needs, but they are artists and craftspeople and ceramicists. They just need a few extra facilities to enable them to do it and more staffing. And I've heard Ella speak many times and she explains this concept so well that in our sector and in the wider public, people with learning disabilities are rarely thought of as cultural producers. Um, which is a missed opportunity for everyone. And the first time she said that, I didn't really understand. I was just like, well, yeah, they are like artists with disabilities. She's like, no, people assume and treat people with disabilities as service users. So, you know, when you think of a, an artist who has learning disabilities, people think of the person with the disability doing some art at a charity set up for people with learning disabilities, not that they're creative producers who are just artists who could then, you know, be independent selling their art or creating beautiful design pieces for hotels or restaurants or something else. They're just there to kind of almost cope with the stress of having a learning disability. It's just you're here, you come into the workshop, great, and you know, we'll, this actually is obviously not how Interart works, but in general, we'll look after you for a bit while you make some art, but it's not that they're an artist working in a studio. So that is another just mind block that we need to try and crash away from. And Ella really is a total trailblazer in that industry. And if you don't know her, write down into what and go and find her. So the main problem, again, linking on from what Ria was talking about, is that it's going to be fairly impossible for us to inspire the next generation of designers without any role models for them to aspire to. So, of course, there are people from every background working in the design and architecture sectors, but the, the percentages are so low that it's very, you know, it's, it's difficult. I'm going to go to the next slide just so you can see this quote um, from Marianne, who's an activist in America, and it says, you can't be what you can't see. And again, as a white middle class person growing up in Britain, majority white country, I never had, um, I never had to really think about this. Working at the BBC even, you know, growing up, there were always lots of women who kind of semi, I mean, didn't look like me, <laughs> but, you know, had a lot of my physical attributes. And, you know, designers and artists and people in literature, music, sport, anything, there was po the possibility for someone like me to step into any of those directions if I chose to and if I, you know, got the grades, you know, that was something that was slightly against me, but um, it wasn't that it was impossible just for who I am and, and yeah, I was just, I was just never confronted by that. Um, so two years ago was when I felt a turn in, I felt one of my, um, yeah, it was one of my turning points. And there was a few triggers that happened. I mean, these have been happening all my life. Like, I've volunteered in homeless shelters for 20 years. Equality has been high on the agenda in terms of who I am as a person. I'm a, a trustee for a human rights charity. We do lots of pro bono work at Zettler. But this Instagram post, strangely, was one of the most um, poignant ones. I don't know if you know Serene Khan. She's an amazing set designer. She does beautiful work and, as far as I knew, you know, had been doing it for a long time and was confident in it because she's so brilliant. Um, and the caption under this picture said, as LDF wraps up for another year, I feel slightly more able and driven. As a South Asian female forging a career within this industry, this was, this was perhaps the first year I felt I belonged and less like an imposter. I felt represented, empowered and reassured. And she wrote that statement because Rhea had a banging show at the Aram Gallery and Lubna Chowdhury had an amazing exhibition at the V&A. She was a ceramicist in residence. And Sita Solanki, who we were working with, had launched a new book and she was starting to kind of cut through in the industry. And there was all these amazing women who were just like Serene or people that Serene really looked up to getting um, media 
inches, being on panel events, you know, having their work celebrated across the industry. And it was just such a kind of beautiful and heartbreaking thing to read that, you know, reading someone say that it's the first time they ever felt like they belonged or had a place or didn't feel like an imposter in an industry where they're so skilled and so talented and so lovely. And in my eyes, kind of had achieved everything that they wanted to, that she was still riddled with the sense of, um, I don't really think I belong here. And it was having those role models in the industry being celebrated and supported that enabled her to feel like she had more of a place. Uh, this is another beautiful quote from a woman called Indiana. I'm using quotes here, by the way. I know it's quite quote heavy, but it's, we're responding here to hard data, which is really vital, and then lots of qualitative feedback. Um, I'm obviously not coming to this whole topic from much personal experience, so I just wanted it to not feel too opinion-y, and actually that it's also not about what we launched with Design Can, it's not about political correctness, it's not thinking it would be nice, you know, that actually we really should be more diverse, shouldn't we? Because, you know, that's just the right thing to do. It's a major serious cultural issue and people are being um, sidelined. So this quote says, within the design industry being so dominated by white males, it leaves a whole group of people questioning their validity and their place within the design community. And I just thought that kind of encapsulated that issue that I've slightly rambled on for slightly too long. Um, quite neatly that when actually what you see on most panels and in most shiny magazines are these people who you've seen for years and years and years and years who are owning it in a certain capacity and who deserve respect for being brilliant but actually come on all the awards and all the people who get quoted on education or um, literally any design topic you can think of there's like 10 people who are just constantly quoted as the expert on absolutely everything and they're just not <laughs> There's just no reason why some man in his 50s is responding to the crisis in education. We should be talking to young people who are living through the crisis in education or balance it out and have lots of people talk about the fact that, you know, they got free education 20 years ago and now people are, you know, being saddled with 10 grand debt a year. Um, and then finally this one, because in terms of representation, people talk a lot about um, ethnic uh, people that are coming from different ethnic groups, they talk a lot about gender. Um, obviously disability is becoming something that people talk about a lot, but actually um, socioeconomic groups are one of the major, major barriers with education. Again, as we heard earlier, for the lucky ones of us who were here for Ria's talk, with design education and creative subjects being stripped from basic state education, you have to come from a fairly privileged background to access creative subjects. And Pip Jamieson, who runs The Dots, says, I often ask myself, what if I hadn't won the middle class lottery of life? There's a strong chance that I wouldn't be where I am now. There are so many squandered minds and creative innovators that we've left behind. Innovators that we've left behind. And I identify obviously with that. Pip is Australian, but you know, she's female. She runs her own business and she would only be in that position if she was able to follow her dreams to an extent and do what she wanted and kind of do what she wanted without fear. Um, we have started recruiting through the dots and it's completely changed our whole business. We used to recruit through The Guardian and Dazeen. We thought go for a national, go for a design title. And actually we got everyone's, everyone's individual, but we got a lot of the same people kind of applying for jobs. And we'd have, um, actually it was when Rupert joined our company that we changed the way we recruited in terms of mentioning that you needed to have a degree to work for Zettler and you needed to have done loads and loads of years of PR to be in a PR agency. And actually, that's not true at all. You need to be a good communicator who loves storytelling. You've got to be interested in things. To work at Zettler, you've got to care about um, topics and issues that are bigger than our business. You know, we're here obviously to make a success of ourselves and we have a lot of amazing clients, but you know, there's other stuff that we need to be doing with our money and our time. And you certainly don't need a degree in PR or in design, to be honest, to be passionate about talking about design. Um, and it's been really exciting in the last year to have a completely different group 
um, socioeconomically speaking, from different backgrounds, coming in, applying for our jobs, coming from really exciting avenues that we would just never have reached before, just because we had a sentence saying, you need to have a degree, and also saying you need to have had PR experience. I got my first PR job at Mr and Mrs Smith after I worked at Television Centre for three years, and James actually said, I couldn't think of anything worse than having a PR person do my PR, <laughs> which I love. And I was like, thanks very much, because I'm hopelessly unqualified. I'll take the job, thanks. Um, and actually, it was just so cool to be given a job in an industry that interested me. And, and had literally, I honestly didn't know what PR was, to be frank. I was just like, I know advertising, PR, I just don't know how it all fits together. And he was like, ignore that. Um, and I told him how much I loved his company, because I'd just bought his book for my mum. And it was from that conversation that I got my job and now I run a PR company. It's ironic, I realise, <laughs> but you just don't have to go through those rungs to become successful in something. Um, it's just very, very close-minded. So my next slide is a man I love, aside from my boyfriend, who I also love. <laughs> Riz Ahmed, I don't know if you know him, is an amazing actor and musician. And this actually isn't going to play, which is also misleading. It's literally a screen grab because I learned how to use Keynote yesterday. And he is a brilliant person. And I really encourage all of you to Google Riz Ahmed House of Commons. It was filmed two years ago and he went to talk to Parliament about um, diversity. And he's talking about it in a cultural context and in a political context. But it's totally applicable to the conversation we're having now. And we did want to get this clip, but it's actually 23 minutes long and we didn't know how to cut a slice out of it. So I'm just going to read you one of the things that he says. And it's about the word diversity and how the word diversity is used across the board to talk about this issue of just having a lack of voices and a lack of questions coming from a broad spectrum of people. And he said, the word diversity sounds like there's a core, a benchmark upon which everything else is measured. And then there's a little bit of something extra you can sprinkle on top. Diversity seems like, in that context, seems like something you can live with, but also something you can live without. We're talking about representation here, not diversity. Representation is not an added extra, it's not a thrill, it's absolutely fundamental to what people expect from culture and from politics. And I think that's such a powerful statement because I was totally and only using the word diversity, but I meant representation. Diversity in the way people use that term, and when I had my first conversation with Luis about coming here, there is a suggestion that people from different backgrounds are inherently different. So you need to get one person from this continent or from that religious background or from that and then together, you know, we'll come together and we'll have a diverse chat. But actually, it's about being representative. It's not about just making it diverse for the sake of making it diverse or making it diverse because that sounds a bit more interesting or PRable or anything. It's literally people have a right to be represented. And in a sector as serious and as invasive as ours, design and architecture and yeah, this world in which we're designing the world, um, I know that sounds a bit grandiose, but actually everything that we engage with has been designed at one stage or another. Representation is just vital. I'm going to stop talking about that. But please do Google that and watch it. Um, and this is Steve. Steve Stu is the guy that did that amazing um, activity asking people uh, to spend one minute thinking about how race had in, um, affected their lives. And he also wrote this quote. And we've had many, many, many quotes and bits of feedback just like this. Fixing the diversity problem, he does use the word diversity, uh, shouldn't fall to minorities. Doing this additional work isn't in their job descriptions. And I think that's really interesting because lots of the conversations that we had about Design Can in the early stages was, why you? Like, you don't even understand what it's like to be a minority. Like, how can you launch a campaign about representation when you are, like, totally standard average? <laughs> and actually, it's because it's not the minority's responsibility or anyone who feels like they're from a minority group to solve the problem or, you know, it's like leaving disabled people to solve the problem of disability in society. This is our problem. Every person here is responsible for trying to enable more minorities to have a part in our conversations. It's just, it's just how it should be. And that's the same with all equality. If we're going to talk about society or education or, 
you know, any part of it. We are all in this together and we all need to do our bit. Um, these are just some s headlines from lots of newspaper articles. Again, when Luis and I had a chat, there was one part of our conversation that kind of really shocked him. And it was that um, article that says black pupils are routinely marked down by teachers. And it's something that people don't think of. They think you're at school, you're like you're not going to be um, downgraded because you come from this background or that. In fact, that's impossible. You know, most subjects are kind of you're either right or wrong. So it doesn't matter what background you come from. And actually, that's just not the way it is. Lots of kids that sat their um, SATs when they were 11 years old had their exam papers marked by their own teachers in their own communities who've spent some time with these kids. And in general, Indian and Chinese children were um, graded higher marks than when they were blind graded and black children were down, they were given less um, marks for the same work. It's a real thing, bias is real. And, you know, in general, the white um, children in these schools were kind of marked and it was fairly accurate. But these perceptions of these different um, children coming from different backgrounds means that they were actually getting different grades. So if you actually think it's not only that you can't necessarily see your um, peers as role models in the industry, but actually you're being downgraded as well. You're literally being kept out of the, even the possibility of being able to get into university to study something if your grades are kept down. There's a massive report in The Guardian uh, that came out earlier this year on um, racial bias. People get more opportunities to come back for, or they get more callbacks for interviews if they change their names, if their surnames sound black or if they sound Muslim. You just don't get callbacks if your name doesn't make the people who are employing th that individual feel like they're employing something that they understand. Um, these things are all working against people. So essentially, this is, it's much, much bigger than design, but we have a responsibility within our sector to do something about it. We can't fix society necessarily, uh, although that is the larger hope, obviously. Um, so there's change is necessary, and there are three ways or three aspects of change that will make it meaningful. People often run off and set up initiatives, all with good faith, and they just crack on and do things like saying we now employ disabled people but actually they can't get in the building there's so much good intention people in general are good this isn't that everyone is racist or everyone is coming at things from a negative standpoint or people don't want to help other people but they don't go through these three tiers one is having some insight so statistics are very helpful some qualitative um feedback we're lucky that we work in an industry where it's just chat all day <laughs> with clients or with designers or um, curators or whoever then you need dialogue and this is what we almost did wrong with design can which i'm going to tell you about in two seconds where we had loads of insight and we had loads of goodwill and we designed a platform that we thought would be helpful a tool it's a kind of manifesto and a tool that we thought was going to be really great and we were going to launch it and then one person at some point said have you asked anyone who knows what they're talking about, what they think of it? <laughs> and we realised that we hadn't actually created a space for people to come to. Obviously, we've done lots of desk research. We've got lots of friends who come from various minorities. We'd worked with the Creative Mentor Network. We'd worked with IntoArt. We thought we had all the information that we needed stored in our heads to design something really useful. But bringing together our steering committee where we brought um, uh, Priya Kanchandani from Icon Magazine and Yinkura Lori and Ella from IntoArt and uh, five or six other people together or five or six people in, in total to come and go through everything that we'd planned, every word in our manifesto, every um, page on the website that we'd designed, the graphic identity. We asked them to yeah, form this steering committee and it changed radically in tone. You know, our, our office we have 11 people or 10 people at that time, and two people are um, people of colour. We don't have any people with disabilities in our team. So our perspective was you know, potentially representative, but actually just focusing on a specific issue, we did need to make sure that we were speaking to many more people. Um, so this is supposed to play. 
it's not, that's fine. That is the opening page of the Design Can website, or is it the next one? Oh, there it is. Uh, so the graphic identity is really beautiful, I would say that. Um, and essentially Design Can, which is design-can.com, is a platform which has got this manifesto, which obviously I'm not going to read at you because it's too long. Our steering committee listed, and then you have a series of resources. So all the statistics and all the insights that I've been reading out today have come from um, what are now uploaded in our resources section. This is where you can find reports, TED Talks, podcasts, um, just loads of resources to try and understand the, the serious issue of representation and find loads of people that can inspire you, who are doing amazing things. Um, we've got this submit page, which we need people to submit to because the community will only survive if we're all in it together. And then you can is the final page on the website and the one that's got the most wild response. And so the whole premise is that there's a manifesto, which is the larger philosophical issue of the serious problem that's in our community. And we've tried to make it so we're giving people a bridge from the kind of relative panic that people feel when they hear that their industry is in crisis, the fear and guilt they feel that they haven't, they're not doing anything about it, and the lack of time people have to invest into issues or trying to find solutions for things. And so this website has been developed by the team and by our amazing steering committee to enable people to get the information they need because what we were hearing lots of and what I love about being a PR person and what's really nice lots of other PR people are here today is that we have um, an inherent kind of position of power with our clients we help them run their or you know curate their panel events we make films we promote them on social media we help them strategize for the collaborations that they should do for editorial they should be involved in creating editorial for their own websites there's a position there where we can influence what they're doing and make it either more meaningful or more interesting or more representative but we were hearing from lots of people that are like they just don't know where to find the information so as much as we hope that the design can and the you can page are really helpful it's also to kind of try and quash a few of those moments of people going I don't know where to find that info you can find it on our resources page so really quickly I just want to go through some of the things that people can do independently to tackle this um, issue head-on uh, number one is recognize your privilege uh, acknowledge that no matter how hard you've worked to get to where you are others facing structural discrimination have had to work a lot harder uh, that's something that people this is this is the point where people find this whole topic extremely controversial. It's not controversial. Recognising your privilege, again, it shouldn't be a controversial act, but it feels controversial because people feel so threatened by the idea that they didn't achieve their own success in its entirety. We have a notion of meritocracy in our country where if you just put in the right hours, if you just try hard enough, you can achieve anything. And I think that is a beautiful vision, but actually there are structural um, systems in place to keep some people out of that loop obviously um, educate yourself there are ways of reading talking to people um, confronting your biases and filling the gaps in your knowledge hopefully our resources page will help with that um, become an ally I didn't really know what being an ally really meant I knew that it meant supporting something but the actual definition is taking on a struggle as if it's your own without making it about you and I think that's a really beautiful kind of way of living that I find really inspiring and it means standing up for others even when it's scary. Uh, drive recognition is what I referenced a minute ago where um, anyone can actively um, celebrate the work of unsung heroes that they know or they've found out about um, either on your social media channels or having conversations with people at dinner in the pub talking about this issue as if it's real if you believe it's real um, and talking about it with people. If you really feel completely powerless in terms of affecting real change, this is the one for you. You can drive recognition by literally making this topic something that you're talking about within your circle of influence. And then use that influence. Um, and that is advocating for people from underrepresented groups in any project you're involved in. Uh, that sounds again quite grandiose but you don't have to use the same photographer you always use you don't have to use the same graphic designer you don't have to collaborate with the same set designers 
or the same thinkers or speakers, you can try and do some research to find other people who might be just as knowledgeable or more knowledgeable and work with them to achieve whatever goal you've got set for whatever festival. With LDF this weekend, it's become very close of mind that I'm looking at all the talks that are on and looking at all of the things that are happening and just wondering how much of that thinking was actually done, if any. And if the only kind of represented conversations happening in the industry are about diversity, that isn't the solution. People are very good at going, we want to talk about representation within design, so let's get in someone from every um, minority group. But actually, you need a balanced, representative group of people talking about architecture or talking about design or materials or whatever it might be. They're not there to talk about their issue. They're there to talk about their area of expertise. And it's that that's really important. Um, and then, of course, whoever you bring in, make sure they're compensated fairly, because lots of people who have either just started their career if they're younger or if they're students are then welcomed into a project and then not paid and you know lucky it's for your portfolio love no pay these people for their time and their perspective because youth is um, an amazing insight for lots of our industry um, refuse one dimensionality if you're invited to be on a project or in a panel and the organizers um, kind of invite you to be involved and you see the lineup and you're a bit like mm, no everyone has come from one background or other and I'm actually not comfortable with being involved um, unless um, there's some more consideration that goes into who's participating. Point them towards truly qualified people from underrepresented groups that could take your place or could work alongside you um, or point them towards our resources page if you want and let them do that work for you. Uh, and then one of my favourite ones actually which I think would be quite alien for lots of people in our industry is to stand aside. If you're asked to work on a project where you think that someone else might be more qualified and would be better suited for the job, then stand aside and suggest them to the person in charge. It's a, it's a kind of, it seems strange to suggest such a thing, but actually it's, it's really, I hate the word generous, it's not generous, it's just right. If someone else is more qualified for the job and they come from a minority background, then that is a major leap into um, a better future. And then mentorship, we talked earlier about that in Ria's talk as well, that becoming a mentor for the next generation um, is, is brilliant. People that need connections, people from different um, family groups or different socioeconomic groups, they don't know anyone in the creative industries. You can be a major bridge for those people in terms of uh, work experience or connections or advice. Um, you don't necessarily have to do the work, but you can enable people to understand how the industry works and uh, introduce them to the right people that could give them more opportunities later on. And then recruit more diversely, which is what I spoke about earlier. Uh, and finally, I love this quote from Helen Keller, who I don't know if people know Helen Keller, but she was an amazing woman. She was blind, deaf and dumb. And she, um, you need to read about her life story. I don't actually have it here, but I watched a documentary about her and she is amazing. And this quote, the world has moved along, not only by the mighty shoves of its heroes, but also by the aggregate of tiny pushes from each honest worker. And I think that people feel powerless in these massive societal crises. And actually everyone does have access to doing something to push it in the right direction. And actually if everyone did do one thing, that really would affect real change. And I said finally for the last slide, but it wasn't finally. <laughs> An industry that fails to reflect the people it serves will become irrelevant. And that also affects all of us too. Thank you very much. <laughs>